people often think about common plants, don't they? And think, oh, well, you don't, I don't want common things in my garden. But but often common plants are grown because they're so good. And it's where, what you mix them with that brings the best out in them. And we've got this amazing tame hare in the gardens. All the things it could eat in 46 acres of gardens, it's eating my little pink collection. <laughs> so I moved my little pink collection, this year's collect, you know, new varieties, and I put them in a different place and it's found them. So it's like it sniffed out about 20 pink plants in 20 acres and it's dribbling <laughs> in them up. Hello and welcome to episode 53 of Talking Dirty. Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, covered in bedazzling white flowers on his blue t-shirt, we have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. And way down there in Cambridgeshire, we have Thordis Maria Sophia Riedrichson. <laughs> Smiling delightfully again, I have to say, and we have a wonderful guest today, do we not? Oh, we're so excited. All of our pre-show chat has been full of the things we're going to talk about. So get ready for a roller coaster ride of flowers and bug chat because organic gardener, award-winning garden writer Val Bourne is back on Talking Dirty. Welcome back, Val. Yes, I'm Valerie Irisborn. You are. I am. And I'm thinking of inventing another name because whenever I come on here, I feel as though I've been deprived. What should we go for? Oh, I don't know. It needs to be you something should... long like Penelope or Rapunzel. <laughs> <laughs> Rapunzel. It needs to be something very ostentatious, I think. Yeah. I'll well, think of something. <laughs> well, maybe it could be butterfly themed because you're wearing a butterfly badge. Tomorrow it's your birthday and you are hoping to celebrate by butterfly spotting. So you are a real keen butterfly gal. I am a real keen butterfly girl. And, you know, I'm a great friend of Matthew Oates, who's the Purple Emperor man. And he was one of the two witnesses at my recent wedding. And um, he's named all his children after butterflies. He's got four. So there's an Arian uh, which is named after a Latin name of a butterfly, blue, I think, but don't quote me. And there's a um, there's a, a lily, a, a millie and a rosy, but they're all plays on butterfly names. <laughs> How wonderful. You could choose one of those for your middle name. Yeah, Vanessa. What about Vanessa? Oh, that's, that's nice. That's a butterfly name. Valerie Iris Vanessa. <laughs> it has a certain, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes. yes. Very yes. sophisticated. No. Yes. <laughs> Not like me though. <laughs> so when it comes to butterfly spotting, I try very hard to plant butterfly plants in my little garden. And I've definitely seen them visiting my Verbena bonariensis, but I don't feel like I've seen very many this year at all. Well, it's a very bad butterfly year this year because it was a very, very cold April. And I think that delayed a lot of birds from nesting and a lot of, um, uh, things were in caterpillar stage when the blue tits started nesting. And blue tits are, well, they rely nearly all on butterflies. So last year, it was meant to be a bumper purple emperor year, according to Matthew Oates. And uh, the blue tits came out and ate all the caterpillars because the timing was a bit wrong. So it's a bit like that this year. And I think it was generally the cold spring because last year, we had so many orange tips, I can't count them. And this year, I think we've seen about three. So I don't know where we're going and I don't think the weather forecast is good, but the one butterfly I want to see is the silver studded blue, which is in the butterfly of acid heaths. So we might be traveling down, or we might just, you know, my favorite butterfly, the one I always go to see is Chalk Hill Blue, which is in the Cotswolds, it's beautiful. And that's always out on my birthday, but I'm, that's a good year for them, actually. Mm. So we, the favourite thing in the garden, obviously Bodleia, but it's flowering precociously early because of climate change. So my Bodleia is magnificent and there's hardly a butterfly on it because it's actually flowering about three weeks earlier than it used to. So it's out of sync with the big butterflies, like the peacocks and the red admirals, all those butterflies, small tortoiseshells which go on it. Uh, one year we came up the path, this was about 10 years ago, and we had about 80 butterflies all fly up in the air at once. And, you know, it was magical. We don't get that anymore. But one of the plants you can really rely on, 
um, are herbs because herbs are Mediterranean plants. And if you grow oreganum, you'll always get butterflies on it because uh, these Mediterranean plants produce extremely concentrated nectar. Um, there's a table of nectar and sugars and oreganum uh, vulgare, which is just ordinary marjoram, has the highest sugar content. I believe it's up, um, I'm not good with numbers. I think it's something like about 70% um, sugar. So butterflies will always go onto Mediterranean herbs that are in flower and lavenders and things like that. So uh, that's probably more reliable. Well, going back to what you, where you just mentioned buddleias, it yes. reminds me of um, one of the first tips that I remember Christopher Lloyd reading that Christopher Lloyd, uh, he did a chapter on pruning in one of his books and he was pruning your buddleias. And you can yes. prune your buddleias as to when you go away on holiday. I think that was his reason for doing it. Yes. But, <laughs> but the harder you prune them, the later they flower. Um, yeah, the trouble is... You can I've give them a healthy chop, if you wish, as well, to delay their flowering a little bit. Yeah, the trouble is, I found, because I'm a big buddlier person, um, I've got um, three, I found that if you cut them back hard with the sort of wetter summers yeah. that we have, the higher temperatures, in my garden, they're producing much flappier growth. Yeah. And then you're getting these horrible winds that break them off. So this year, I didn't prune it down nearly as low because I, had, I have a clematis going through it. Um, is it Elsa Spaith? Yes. I think. Uh, it's a blue one anyway. I should have chosen a much better color because it's a purplish buddleia. I should have chosen a contrasting color. And because it was so cold, I didn't like to cut it down too low anyway, because I was afraid I might lose it. But um, I've, I've got a, a slightly different buddleia called Pink Pagoda which is quite hard to get. And it's a Davidii Weyeriana cross. Now, you know Weyeriana usually has orange yeah. globular flowers and it flowers in September. Yeah. Well, this pink pagoda flowers later. And I got it from um, Longstock, where the national collection is. Um, and uh, I'm planting that one and it's not really got going yet. So um, I'm hoping that that will, you know, plug the gap when it finally gets going by just flowering a bit later. I think but it probably will, but, but I, I'm, I'm just thinking that I'd love to walk around your garden with you, Val, because um, it's almost like every plant that you grow tells a story. It does. I mean, every plant's got a story, hasn't it? And yeah. I've got, my, my husband always says, I've got a mind like a filing cabinet. And I remember <laughs> things. But I wish so, I did. <laughs> I can't remember numbers, and I'm hopeless with lots of things. I'm not terribly good with names and faces, but if it's a plant, I'm there. I'm better with plants than with anything else, but that's not saying much. Um, Alan, <laughs> I know you have very keen butterfly spotters who come to East Ruston and keep kind of records of what they see. Have you heard any reports of what you've had at East Ruston this year? Well, uh, Morris and Betty, they used to come regularly. Morris used to do the Norfolk Butterfly Log, but unfortunately, I mean, age catches up with us all. So alas, Boris and Betso no longer are able to come to the garden. But I do remember he, he did. He told me off one day when I referred to cabbage white butterflies. He said, boy, there's no such thing. They are large white large butterflies. Bites. <laughs> 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 so alas, no, we don't have the records anymore. But um, it was very interesting. And going back to what you said earlier, um, Val, that you thought you might be coming up to Norfolk to, to look look for... Volotails. Volotails. Well, we don't have that lovely milk parsley thing in the garden very much. I, I have planted some of it, which is the food, um, the food source of, of swallowtails, because we have had the odd swallowtail in the garden here. And I remember going out one day and finding some, uh, finding one on an agapanthus, but alas, it was dead. And I think... <laughs> They, do they come here to die? I'm saying to myself. <laughs> oh, no, but they do die. They, they don't live very long, butterflies. No. They're, they're, you know, they're original, you know, they're the original sort of psychic spirit almost. That's the thing. I love them. One and a half down the road, there's quite a colony of them um, on the fen. So, you know, where yes. there's water, they I love think them. we could be visiting you in the holiday. Well, I look forward to that. We're at Chroma. <laughs> That's right. Too far. <laughs> <laughs> there's nine of us, by the way. <laughs> Generations. Right. I've got a large table. Really nutty. <laughs> <laughs> it 
because I mean, Alan said earlier we were we had quite a long chat before we officially recorded, and it's really lovely that you're planning a trip. You mentioned various generations. You've got a really keen granddaughter, I think, who's who's big yes. into nature and wildlife. Yes, Ellie is wonderful, and she's a very good photographer. And it's very annoying because we we've been taking her to butterflies, and I think it is us. We've encouraged her when she was tiny. And her father is very good, Stu. And uh, they go off and um, they went off a couple of weeks ago looking for purple emperors in Furmin's Wood, which is up in Wellingborough, which is a very good site for them. And they found 11 and there were loads of people looking for them. And Ellie pho- did this wonderful photograph. I can send it to you. And uh, she's just so keen on her butterflies. It's wonderful. And she's been, she went down to Portland Bill last week looking for large tortoise shells. There's a quarry there, but didn't see them. But, you know, we do go out quite a lot. And she decorated her hat in the Savonate last year because purple emperors were in sad uh, decline that year. And we, we didn't see any. So she went off into the, into the wood and decorated her hat with all fern fronds and came out. And we had to tell her that one had flown right over us when she was in the wood decorating her hat. <laughs> so there's a wonderful picture of Ellie scowling under all this greenery. <laughs> so I feel very, I feel very lucky, you know, because all the children are interested in wildlife. That's wonderful. Can we give a shout out to moths as well? I mean, um, not all of. Well, them. have a moth trap. Oh, tell us about, tell us about that. But we don't use it often enough. I think you have to be quite organised, you know, we have to sort of tremble it out. It has to be a dry night because of the electricity wire. But we do we do catch a lot of hawk moths in there oh. and a lot of very interesting and pretty moths. And probably we might get, if we set it up on a warm summer's evening, we might get about, you know, 150. But there's a friend of mine who's in the butterfly conservation who has a really posh moth trap with a really wonderful lamp. And he thinks it's a bad night if he doesn't get a thousand. Oh, good. He's not far away. Wow. Moths yeah. are terribly interesting, but of course they're in decline as well. I mean, that's one of the reasons we haven't got cuckoos, because there are so few large moths. Do you remember when you were a child? I always used to get into trouble on a Friday night for leaving the kitchen door open because <laughs> my mother used to do the washing with the mangle and things. And she'd be in there and there'd be like 50 moths. We lived in West London and there'd be like 50 moths fluttering around the washing mangle. <laughs> she just gets across. And you just, you know, if you leave the window open now, you, you don't get any moths at all. We're living in a different world. And that's what we've got to explain to people. You know, we have got to get on top of this and bring diversity back. It's a complicated subject because say you've got a small garden, it could be tempting to, I don't know, maybe try to do too much where when it comes to the food plants for the caterpillar, don't you have to plant quite a lot of something like that or else it's no good? Say you have a small patch of nettles, would it be better Mm. to use that place for say pollinator plants rather than a small patch of nettles, which isn't actually going to be very kind of useful for the caterpillars? Well, I think the thing is that, um, you know, gardens are a patchwork, they join up. So when you, if you went up in a hot air balloon over Birmingham, you'd look down and you'd see a patchwork of gardens and they do join up. But people are too busy. I've just been writing an article on Room 101 for the amateur gardening about what I would put in Room 101. And my number top priority is the strimmer. I nearly called it something else then. The (laughs) strimmer. If people had to do it with shears, they wouldn't do it. You know, they need to be less tidy and, and they need to see what's there. You know, it's, I think, to be, to manage it less in a way, mm. especially around the edges, you know, to have the wild patches, you know, not mow all the lawn. That would help terrifically because a lot of our butterflies, the brown family, they all lay eggs on grasses. I mean, some butterflies are incredibly specialised in what they, they lay eggs on. But even if we could get more ringlets, more of the butterflies that, you know, are on nettles. I mean, I went down the farm track last year, all these wonderful peacock caterpillars, black wriggly things in in little webs, hundreds of them. A day later, flailed. Mm. You think, why? We've got to be be more considerate, basically. If you've got a small garden, um, and it it is difficult because, I mean, I'd love to leave the, the... 
uh, lawn long. We all know that we have compromises to strike in our lives. Yes, um, it's difficult with a dog. I do agree with that. So, I mean, I, you know, I plant a lot of things, but if people have got small spaces and they can't have the lovely meadows and things they'd like, what would be your top things they should be planting? Plant densely. It wouldn't be plant. Grow the things that grow well for you. Pollinators, you know, are very easy to attract. But plant densely so that you can't see the soil by the end of May, because then you've got um, a shady understory where you're going to get beetles and insects. And the other thing is to plant plants of different types and different colours. So if we look at this plant, for instance, which is one of my favourite plants, it's not in flower yet, just bud. It's a shrubby umbellifer. I've talked about it before. This is a hoverfly magnet. When I was out just now, there were hoverflies everywhere on these crocosmias. You know, so you just plant different coloured things. You know, just just enjoy yourself. Actually, it's very interesting what you say about hoverflies, Val, because um, my little kitchen courtyard, which is directly outside my back door, <clears throat> is the last area of garden here. Re mainly because we're open to the public. It's the last area of garden yes. to get a facelift at, at, in spring and early summer. And I was working on it this weekend and I brought out of the greenhouse um, a lemon tree. Now this sad, this is a poor sad lemon tree that was very badly treated. I was going to throw it on the compost heap and then Jenny who works in the greenhouses with me on Monday, she said, no, don't do that. I'd like to try and rescue it. So I grudgingly have to say, let her rescue it. And, and she has. And I brought it out of the greenhouse in its pot, standing it in the back courtyard. And it was just buzzing with hoverflies. It's, the flowers are out on it now, beautiful yes. lemon flowers. Um, but it was just buzzing with them. And, and it was, it's absolutely amazing. You're so right in what you say. I mean, yeah. you're diverse in what you plant um, and plant the things that will grow well for you. And even if it's, you know, if it's a tender thing you're bringing out of the greenhouse. Yes. Give it a holiday and let it be pollinated. And yes, I mean, hoverflies are wonderful because they do pollinate. They don't actually drink nectar um, very often. Um, that's not absolutely true. That's just a bit of a generalization, but they're mainly after collecting pollen. And then they lay, they look for colonies of aphids or whitefly, and they lay one single um, egg, a bit like a uh, tiny cream rugby ball. And then the larvae comes out which is a bit like a translucent slug normally, and that eats the aphids. So you get pest control and pollinator in one. And we were talking about wildlife and encouragement. I think the other thing is grow lots of different things and don't put your garden to bed in September. A number of people bounce up to me and say, I put the garden to bed as though it's snowball. I mean, you know, it's just like nuking the garden. You know, leave it, tidy it in the spring. Some things you might have to cut down, but try and leave as much of it up as possible because that's all shelter for insect life. Mm. Yeah. With your umbella for there, was that fruticosum, your bupleurum? The bupleurum fruticosum. Yeah. I'm very excited because I saw that at Beth Chateau's nursery when I visited the garden and I bought that as my Valborn plant. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, it's lovely because it makes a big round of. And, um, you know, I do cut it back in the spring. I didn't cut it back much this spring. It was a bit sort of savage, wasn't it? But it's just so wonderful in August because it turns, it's green now. These are the buds. And then when it flowers, it gets this mustard haze on it. And then it's just covered in flies because different insects like different colours. And flies and hoverflies are very keen on green and white and tiny flowers. The other flower that's absolutely covered in hoverflies at the moment is the annual carrot that the flower ladies like, Dara, Carota Dara, with the sort of uh, maroon heads. That's absolutely full of flies. Can I ask a personal question about the Bupleurum? Because when you buy a little baby one, it's just one sort of random yeah. stem. Do you just leave it to do its thing? I would leave it at that stage and then next spring I'd probably um, pinch a bit of it out and see if you can persuade it to branch. Um, it's, I found it perfectly hard. It's, it's on the gate, which gets these facing winds. And it has, as I said before, this wonderful clematis called Glasnevin Dusk, which is like a um, chocolate colored tangutica. And I've just given a lot of cutting material to a commercial nursery to get it into the trade. Just going back to Bucleurum for, for a moment, you didn't mention, we didn't mention the leaves and I do think the leaves are quite That's handsome on that. Lovely. Everybody plants olive trees. Yeah, I think this is a good olive tree look-alike, foliage-wise. 
And it's much more comely in its habit. Yes. And it's such a good insect plant. And and you can get things to ramble through it. It doesn't have to be um, glass and even dusk. You could have a little viticella going through it, one of the more gentle ones, like little baths with tiny little bluish flowers. It's a lovely one, little baths. I might have to do just that. It can be like my Val Vaughan pop of the garden. Yes. (laughs) Now, obviously, I've got fine weed up mine at the moment. I wouldn't put that in. (laughs) We've seen little glimmers there of the show and tell on the video version that is surrounding your laptop or your computer. So um, we've got the bubbler and we saw a little hint of crocosmia. I know you brought several to the party today. Yes, I did. I said my birthday was tomorrow. What I didn't say is I was born on the hottest day of the year and I'm a Leo and I love bright colours. And uh, my mother never quite forgave me. And she didn't know it was twins until about four weeks before. So it was all a bit <laughs> rushed. But I really like crocosmas, crocosmias. I think they're really good value. And they're South African plants. And um, they do have a hardiness problem, some of them. So I have bought hellfire. And if you look at it, it's completely red. It's the only completely red crocosmia in a pot. And what cosmias do as they grow is they make the new corm underneath and then they make the new corm underneath. And when a cosmia has been in for about five years, it goes down very deep and there's a string of corms and this helps its hardiness. So with this cosmia, which I have lost before, and I advise everybody to do this if they buy a cosmia at this time of year, is to put it in a pot not in the garden and allow it to have a couple of years in a pot so that it can develop some corms, uh, deeper corms underneath. So this is Hellfire. And I think Hellfire was bred by a man called Paul Lewis on the Isle of Wight. And he is breeding crocosmias that get through the winter. Of course, he's in the Isle of Wight. He's also bred a yellow one, which is called Paul's Best Yellow, I think. He has. I've got that, but it's not out yet. Well, mine is just just blooming now, um, and it really is a very good garden plant. It it it, it bulks up well, and it sh- it flowers for a re- very long time, which is something that I think probably could cost me a Lucifer, bred by Alan Bloom of, of Bloom's Nurseries yeah. in South Norfolk. I mean, his Crocosmia Lucifer flowers for all of about two and a half weeks, and this. I really- know. And the other thing is, it's a very aggressive grower. And I spend the whole time trying to dig it out. And yeah. also, it's a little bit early. So it's flowering at the beginning of July. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's a sort of a tomato red. It's a wonderful plant. But it's got nothing to relate to. You know, there's exactly. nothing else that's orange at that time. Exactly. exactly. And, you know, so by the time these ones come out, um, there's a new Fire Stars series that uh, Paul has uh, bred. Uh, and he, it was launched about three years ago at Hampton Court by Rosie Hardy. And uh, there are five of them in this Fire Star series. And I've got one of them called Scorchio, which is absolutely brilliant. It's red and yellow. And I did pick it, but I think I dropped it on the garden in the way because I can't see it in my pot. <laughs> but that's an, his Fire Star series is very hardy. You know, I planted it. I, I, I bought it in the summer. I didn't plant it till the next summer. And uh, well, the next spring actually, and that gave it just a bit more time to settle in. Crocosmias actually have a uh, quite an association with Norfolk because there's a chap called George Davidson. Yes, um, indeed. He has a well, there's a Crocosmia called uh, George Davidson named after him, and I think he probably started at Westwick Hall in Norfolk, which is near North Walsham, which is about seven or eight miles from me. Yes. And then I think the collection from there went to probably Earlham Hall, or there was a connection between Earlham Hall in Norwich, and then to Retton Hall, which is near Thetford, and then to Breckles Hall, which is near Attleborough, and finally, just down the road to Wilby Hall. <laughs> yes, there were three main breeders. So George Davison was one, and I can't remember the names of the other two. But Norfolk, in the early years of the 20th century, was definitely... Yeah the Crocosmia breeding mm. uh, place in the country. And that's because of the dry winters, because I'm, of course, I have the wet winters. And when Alan Bloom bred uh, Lucifer, um, one of the things, reasons he bred it is he, he never really was interested in growing Crocosmias because he had damper soil at Brussingham yep. and hardiness was a problem. 
But when we had the winter of 1963, he just imagined remember. that all those crocosmias he had would be wiped out. And they weren't. And then he realized that they were hardy. So he he bred Lucifer and he he actually bred it. It was a seedling and he named it in um, 1964. So it was only a year or two afterwards. And then it's become Bloom's most successful plant. And I can't remember if I told you how the name arose. I I told you well, Dr. it was Matt. a Latin, Latin teacher working on the railway. I know this from Alan because he was a dear friend. A Latin teacher working on the railway. And he asked um, uh, this Latin teacher to think of a special name because if Alan had a star plant, he didn't call it Bressingham something or other. He wanted a, an attractive name. And uh, this chap was a teacher and teachers always mark their books on uh, Sunday nights, as I know to my cost. And uh, the chap lit up his pipe, looked at the matchbox and Lucifer was on it. So when he went back the next week, he said Lucifer and Alan really liked it. Even though he was a Quaker, not, <laughs> not one with the devil. And it is a super plant. You see it everywhere. I mean, it's, I suppose, a testament to its hardiness and its vigour that you do see Lucifer everywhere. It's worldwide. I mean, it is, it is a good plant, but Christopher Lloyd never liked it because it was too early. And I, I do agree with that. And yeah. I do have a problem with it here. This one's called Columbus. And that's a good one. And, and the reason I love this is this herringbone of buds. I don't know whether you can pick yeah. that up. Yeah. And, and when they first come out, they've got a purplish tinge to them. Uh, and it's, that's an, a shorter for me, a shorter yellow Columbus. And it's really good. There was an um, early yellow one called Norwich Canary as well, I think. Yes, which... yeah, there was a lot. Yeah. And you yeah. see, I can't keep them all. So um, Star of the East, for instance, which I yeah. love, mm. and that's a Norfolk one. It, it died out here. It's a, October quite often in, in a higher part of the world. They can come in certain places, but not here. And mm. it's a really large flower. So mm. I'm planting one that... Um, Hard is a selling. I will send you a picture of it. And I've got this one, which I've never known the name of. And this is flowers just after Lucifer. Uh, and it's a sort of very muted, it's very branched head. So it's definitely paniculata, I should think. Yeah. And it's, it's rather sort of uh, softer, smaller flowers. I like that very, very much. But I don't know the name of it. Out of interest, Val, out of interest, I think if somebody... If we've got gardeners listening and they grow a variety of crocosmias, why not save a few seeds and grow some from seeds yourself? Because yes. they, they like dahlias, they will interbreed and you might get a hundred bad ones, but you might just get one good one. I think that's what Mark Wash on the Tamar Valley. Yeah. Anna Nursery, I believe, does mm. Leps and Salt Seed. And I've got various other reds and oranges that I don't know the name of. This one actually came from John Makepeace's mother. <laughs> the furniture, and well, the furniture um, he used to live in our village, and at one time in Northamptonshire, and his mother was a really good gardener, and she gave me this, um, and uh, that would be in about 1978. So it might be that it's one of Bloom's seedlings because when he raised Lucifer, he named things like Spitfire and Vulcan and all sorts of other things. But I really, really do love microcosmias. And I like the foliage after the flowers have gone. Um, you know, you get that wonderful sword-shaped foliage, yep. which is so important in a border. One of the modern day uses for crocosmia in the floristry trade is to actually cut the seed heads and use yes. the seed heads. In, yeah, I've seen them in heads. London, in, in posh florists, if you like. Yeah, posh florists. I, they're called cherries, apparently. On the, when, when I was writing up the crocosmia trial fairly recently, which was held at Wisley a couple of years ago, um, I had to meet um, um, Lady Skelmersdale of Broadley Bulbs, yeah. who terrifies me. And um, she kept talking you about You call me cherry. Christine, not me, her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Christine. Um, she terrifies me, and she kept talking about cherries, and finally I plucked up the courage to say cherries. And she said, cherries are the seeds, Val. Oh, I thought, because I tend to cut mine off here because I don't actually want... Um, anything to, uh, in my cros crosmias to self seed because we're quite damp here on the spring line and they're quite aggressive growers. So I, I don't actually want, you know, uh, loads of seedlings popping up. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about crocosmias is they, they do like um, 
quite a lot of water, strangely enough, although they've got this hardness problem. And when I went to South Africa, I was lucky enough to go and lecture at the Cape Town Flower Show about 14 years ago. And um, I went off and I spent some time in South Africa. And the thing that you notice is that all the plants, the interesting plants are, are very close to water courses. So you'd get things like agapanthus in water filled ditches. And people imagine that South Africa is a sort of almost tropical paradise. Well, I did. And when I went there, it was um, September time and the climate's quite rugged. I mean, if you closed your eyes and you were in the, in the Cape, you would imagine that you were in the Scottish Highlands because there's all this uh, interlocking spurs and rock. And um, the days that we were there, we spent two weeks there. There was a really strong wind coming up from the pole. And uh, so, it, so it was windy. Uh, and they actually get about 60 inches of rain on the Cape, but they get it on different sides of the Cape. And I always have to look at my piece of paper um, because they get the winter rain on the Western side. I hope I've got this right. The winter rain on the Western side, they get it um, during the winter. So the climate's very Mediterranean. And that means all the plants do their growing in the winter. So when you get something like an Agapanthus, which has species on both sides and across the Cape, not many, but you know, they're, they're spread about. It means the species on the Western side of the Cape that are getting the winter rain are more or less evergreen and they're not as hardy. Mm. On the other side of the Cape, they're doing it in reverse. They're getting summer rain. And again, a, a, a lot of rain in one season. And then it's colder and drier in winter. So the agapanthus over there are deciduous and hardier. So there is some truth in the, in the sort of thing that the foliage, if it's sort of evergreen and wide and doesn't die down, it's probably not going to be as hardy as a deciduous uh, agapanthus. But the thing I found interesting was the amount of rainfall that these areas had. You, know, you imagine South Africa being a very benign climate. It actually is quite, a, it, I didn't find it like that. I found it quite rugged. And of course, um, Agapanthus in South Africa, I mean, that is a thuggish plant. Oh, it's an absolutely endemic in all the ditches. You know, you, wherever you drive, you know, you'll see it. Uh, and of course, it's caused problems on places like the Scilly Isles and various other places where it's warmer and they have a damp, moist climate in winter. It's pro caused a problem in the desert <laughs> with Graham here because... He says that, you know, they, every seedling, that every seed that falls in that gravelly landscape, which has got very light soil underneath the gravel, every single one seems to germinate because they have such a questing rootstock. They, you know, they're difficult to get out. If you don't get them out when they're very young, they're very difficult to get out. And the only way to do it is to weed kill it. Um, yes. but it, it they can become a nuisance, as can, you know, we, we mentioned crocosmias earlier, but mombrichas, the old wild mombrichas. Yeah, that's it's a real fun. Yes, it's in Southern <laughs> Ireland. It's become a, a problem plant, I think. You see it all I think over it Cornwall as well, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which agapanthus? I, I have got here, um, uh, I have to think about this, Northern Star, which was bed by Dick, Dick Fulcher, who had the nursery down on Dartmoor. It, I think it's a really good one. I think it's probably something to do with Midnight Star, uh, which is Priscilla Bacon's. Um, yes, she she, she yeah. collected them, didn't she? She did. But somebody has taken that and renamed it Navy Blue, I think. Ah, oh, well, there's a lot of wrong naming. But yes. this is quite a dark one. And, and you know, it, um, it has this sort of stripe in the petal. And yeah. it's a northern star is good because it's a deciduous one. So you haven't got masses of, you know, foliage overwhelming it. And when the foliage starts to grow, it's very neat, but it has this dark shading at the base. Yeah. So when you get the buds and this and the dark shaded foliage at the base, um, I grow a lot of ours in pots, which um, the best beloved will object to because actually he waters them. I don't really do anything with them. And uh, they are terrible things. Steve Hickman, um, uh, who grows a lot of agapanthus on his Hoyland plant centre nursery, uses chainsaws to cut them up. They, they yeah. are very, very. But um, I grow agapanthus uh, in pots, a lot of them. So this is Northern Star. I couldn't pick a lot because a lot of them aren't out yet. But one I did want to tell people about was Allen Street, which is a dark blue one 
which is very, very floriferous. It's the dark, darkest blue, much darker than this. And the only other one before that was Black Panther. And it was very shy to flower. And Allen Street is amazing. It puts out loads of flower buds. So um, I'm keen on Adranthus. I've got a couple that um, I bought last year, which I'm trying, and they are um, repeat flowering agapanthus, which is quite nice because you get... I haven't got those. Yeah, you, you get... There's one called Pop in Purple, and the flowers are actually dark purple. Um, and it, it's flushing up with its first flush now, and then we'll have a second flush. It will try and have a third one because when, when you get to the end of October and into November, the days are shorter. It doesn't quite make yes. it. But I often think that if you took it under cover and had... Um, you maybe even though the light levels are low, you might get some sort of pale mauvey flowers throughout the winter. It's possible. Yes, we've got one called Whole Park Estate. It produces two stems of enormous flowers, but they're sterile. And when we take the agapanthus into the unheated greenhouse, um, November time probably, that will go on until Christmas. It's amazing. Mm. But you don't get many flowers. It's like everything. It's like bananas isn't it? Yes. If you get enormous bananas, you get two a pound. Yeah. You know, so it's yeah. like enormous flowers. You don't get many of them ever. <laughs> but we really rate tall bargiers for going on flowering. Yes, they're very good. Yeah, this is my best one. Um, I got this from Graham Goff, and it's um, John May's special I bought it as from Graham Goff. And it's as tall as an agapanthus. It's got loads and loads of flower stems, and it begins in about May, and it just carries on flowering until about November. It's not in a very good place because it's in front of the Budlia, so it doesn't really show off. But it's a brilliant plant, John May's special. Uh, and that's... Uh, uh, so we rate tall bargiers because they give us a longer season of flower. But again, we've got them in pots because we are cold here. But the other thing about pots is, and agapanthus, is it raises them up. They're more dramatic. Yeah. I do have agapanthus in the ground, but mm. they flower later. Uh, and having them in pots, you know, you get much more impact from them. And uh, I'm also a big diorama fan. Um, I just put, I can't, most of mine are over, but they're angels fishing rods because they do this and they quiver. And then you get these wonderful seed heads. Um, and I first saw dioramas um, in Jim Mann's Taylor's garden and he had the National Collection at Westbury on Seven. And I was meant to be looking at the flow mist, but I couldn't take my eyes off the dioramas because <laughs> they were all under the paving and popping up in the paving. And he gave me some seeds and that's how I started. And um, the thing about them is they're really easy from seed. If you put seed down on the ground, they're like little bulbs, and cover them with gravel, in a two or three years time, you will have probably four years, a a flowering diorama, but they need that cool root run. So that's why they were growing underneath the, uh, underneath the paving. So we've got them all along the front of our house as a gravel strip and then paving. And they absolutely adore it there because they've got, they're getting moisture at the root. They're like a crevice. So I <laughs> love my dioramas. And I've got lots of different colors and lots of different types. Um, and then, of course, they they like the rain as well, and they're very rugged. I mean, they resist the, they resist the sun. All South African plants, whether it's called cosmias or agapanthus or topogias, they resist the weather because they've got thick petals, lots of pigment in the petals. And they just sh and dioramas are beautiful in the rain. They just drip. Not that we've and had any rain, and they're very good in the wind as well because of that spring. Yes. Like another South African plant, the ixia. Yes. Um, a very wiry stem that sort of yes around in the wind, but it, but it bends beautifully. Yes, um, we don't have many exias here. We do have some, but not many because we tend to lose them. Yeah, yeah. Um, because of winter wet. Because it isn't cold that kills things in the winter. No, it's actually wet. wet. Mm -hmm. And if you're planting something like gladioli, should you be into gladioli? And um, I'm getting more into gladioli. I, I, I can see my dahlia bed on the allotment being interspersed with gladioli. Put some coarse grit under the bulb when you plant them out. You know, if you're planting the corn in early May, put some grit under if you're wet. That will help tremendously. And stake as you plant. Yes, you don't, you don't spoil the corn. I think 
One of the mm. things that I'm getting into more is the species gladiola. And I've got two that have done particularly well this year. One I'm building great stocks of is um, gladiolus cardinalis, which is red and white flowers. Yes. Um, and it, 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 I've got it in a raised bed where it, it flows gracefully over the edge. Yes. And it looks stunning. And the other one is Darlinii. I don't know whether you oh, know I don't that know that one, but I know cardinalis. It grows above the cape in the scrub there and the best beloved is a botanist and he left me in the scrub to search for gladiolus. <laughs> Actually South Africa's not that um South Africa's not that safe a place sadly. So he no. left me in the middle of this burnt out scrub because I was finding it difficult because it was scratching my legs and I had shorts on. So he left me there and said I'll go and get the car and I will pick you up. So I'm in the scrub, fairly close to the road. I can't move because I'm afraid if I do, he won't find me. He was two hours. I said, have been looking for gladiolus, cardinalis, he said. Hmm. I know that part. What was your other one, Alan? <laughs> it's, it's Darlinii, which is one of the species that was used in breeding bigger gladioli, but Darlinii is actually orange and yellow, and it's a very dainty thing. It's, it's quite upright growing, but it's, like, it's, it's just like a miniature gladioli, if you like. I've had it for probably about five or six years, I think, and um, I, had, uh, I think I had three corms to start with um, from somewhere or other, I can't remember where. Um, but I bulked them up until I've got two pots and I planted last year one of the pots out in, in, the, um, in the sunk garden in a raised bed. And it's, it's, it's just flowering now and it is a beautiful thing. It has a delicacy yes. about it that um, a Dame Edna Everidge would definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I think Dame Everidge, Everidge has a lot to answer for when it comes to gladioli. Because yeah. the flower <laughs> ladies love them and they don't mind them frilly and big. I'm not yeah. liking on them frilly and big, but no. um, I grow that one, that one uh, called Ruby. Is Papilio Ruby. Adios Papillon, yes. Yes. Uh, that, um, was at Hadspen, and actually yeah. nobody else really had it, and it was just growing at Hadspen. And then Nigel Rowland of Longacre Plants w was allowed to go in before they bulldozed it and flattened yeah. it, and he rescued it. But that's better in a pot for me than it is in the garden. It, well, it does grew, in the garden, but it flowers much better in a pot. I grew that from seed, from self-saved seed, and we got a range right. of colours ranging from that smoky, mm -hmm. greeny papilio um, colour yes. right way through dusky pinks. Every every shade was what I'd call like a Jeffrey Benison Prince print yes. that's a bit <laughs> faded, you know, and got I, a sort of a murky look to it. I noticed because I do a lot of trawling of plant sites on the net. That and Bora. <laughs> I noticed that Avon have got a very smoky purple seedling yeah. from Ruby. So yeah. I'm planning to get in there and order that. Yeah, I think you should. There are also some really plant. crazy colours, aren't there? Like kind of limey. Oh, yes. There's one called Evergreen, which is a really frilly one. I think that's the brightest green. And there's another one called Green Star, which starts off green, but that fades to yellow. So it's much subtler. But you know those you know, sooty black colours that you get in dahlias and gladioli don't come mm. in anything else. And you, if you plant them on their own, they just get lost against the soil. But if you put them with a bright pink or a bright orange or any bright colour, really, that makes them stand out. So I, I do like the sooty, sooty colours. Talking of bright colours, um, when I last went for a walk around East Ruston Old Vicarage uh, a couple of weeks ago, there were more alstroemerias, I think, than I have ever seen in my yes. life. Uh, so many different kinds. And I had <laughs> such alstroemeria envy. And I know, Val, that in your show and tell vases, your many that you've brought today. Yes. Oh, well, there I you go. Because I can't bear to cut things. <laughs> but this, this is Indian summer. Indian summer is wonderful because I've got it on a raised bed. And if you've got something that you don't know whether you're going to be able to grow it, um, a raised bed about a foot high is so much better drained and straight into the soil. And this is covers a huge, a huge corner of that raised bed. And it's been in there probably seven or eight years. Dusky foliage comes up and then these wonderful things. And this for me is one of my favorite um, uh, sort of July 
plants because it's so good. And the interesting thing about Alstroemerias is they're grown for the cut flower trade. So that's why they were developed because they lasted water. And a lot of plant breeding was done for that reason, whether it's peonies or roses or whatever. But what you should do is not cut your Alstroemeria off when it's finished. You should pluck it out when it's finished flowering. And that promotes um, uh, vigor from the meristem underground and then you get it comes back quicker. So that's a one tip, but this is an amazing thing. And um, I've got it, you know, just in that corner and growing with all sorts of, all sorts of things that um, particularly good with blues. And this is another one of my great July favorites, Heliopsis summer nights. I mean, this is a tall willowy plant. This is just one little stem, but I'm sure you can see it's got a red stem and mm -hmm. the flower when it's very fresh has a red middle and it doesn't get any bigger than this. It's truly perennial for me, which um, um, Biden's isn't. Uh, do I mean Biden's? No, yes, I mean yes. Rudbeckia tomentosa is what I mean. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, that Rudbeckia um, that is lovely, Rudbeckia. very similar looking that flowers later. That doesn't... It's very light thing. soil, I think. Yeah. Well, I think I'm just a bit too cold. I can have mm. it. I grow it from seed. But this you can grow summer nights from seed but I think I bought this as plugs. But this is so wonderful because it's it's the first yellow daisy that flowers for me, and it's so willowy and airy. And I've got a real thing about dark stems, so it's coming up um, through Astacalliope, uh, which yeah. isn't yet, but it's just beautiful. Like little stars, it's a wonderful thing. That is so, really. Yes, I wish I had lots of Alstromeas like you. In fact, I've got Acre Envy. Oh, we've all got acre envy. <laughs> you can tell how keen I am with my plants. <laughs> yeah, keen you, could, I am. you could do with 30 more acres. Maybe Alan can send some your way. Uh, can, off the top of your head, Alan, can you remember any of the other Alstrom areas you've got? Because um, there are several. Well, the funny thing is that lots of them were given to me by... Um, this is my mother's best red Alstroemeria. Would you like a spadeful? That's the best plant, free, yes. and no name to worry about. <laughs> no, but it, it came from Paul's mother, you see, and that's the way I've got lots of the Al Alstroemerias, I'm afraid. So, But I, I would like to grow um, some of the recently bred purple hybrids because they appeal to me. And if I can get one with like <clears> uh, um, uh, the one that you just showed, Val, with, with dark foliage, I would live so much the better. But I just there take the one. Um, <clears throat> there has an Astromeria trial on at Wisley several years ago, which was a complete disaster. Really? Because they were planted and the man, Viv, Viv Marsh, or Viv, Viv Marsh, yes. of, yeah, yeah. I can't remember the name of his nursery, stupidly, but he'd given a lot of plants and he said to the RHS, if they're newly planted, you must really mulch them thickly. And he said, you know, five or six inch layer. And a lot of the panel said, oh, ridiculous, ridiculous. Winter came and Wisley's very cold. It gets a lot of quite harsh frosts. Mm -hmm. And they all went because they weren't mulched. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't mulch Indian summer because it was on a raised bed. No, I don't know. Because well, the trouble with all these plants is they flower in the second half of summer and autumn. A lot of things we're attracted to, like penstemons and crocosmias and alstromerias, you know, we buy them, we plonk them in, and they don't have any time to make proper roots before winter descends. Mm. So I, th I think probably if I bought an alstromeria, it is called purple something. Could the alstromeria be purple rain? Might, might be. I'd have to go back to my, my notes because I judged that trial. Or Although purple. it was a very short trial. Because they all died. <laughs> I, I I treated myself to a trip to Plantsman's Preference in Suffolk or Norfolk, South Norfolk, I suppose. Tim Fuller's Tim nursery. Fuller. Yeah, the lovely Tim Fuller, uh, who hopefully will get on here uh, if he has <clears> some time. Um, but oh, there were so many things I wanted to buy, and I I did I channeled you a little bit, Val, because whenever I'm at a nursery and I don't buy something, I think, oh well, there was that time Val talked about, you know buying things you don't know how long you've got I appreciate that th th there was an age difference there but well, you've got more time than me <laughs> but it's, it's always encouraging to channel you if I'm at a nursery um but I didn't with this beautiful Alstrom area which was Cit Citachina I'm ah uh, 
Yes, that's been around a long, long time. That's that's a very old plant. Bob Brown used to sell it, you know, 30 years ago. Beautiful. I'm looking at the photos I took of it now. Why didn't I buy it? But anyway, well, um, it's, I didn't. it isn't easy on um, my soil, but I used to live in Hook Norton, which was much drier garden on Ironstone, and that was good. It, it produced flowering stems, but it was it's nowhere near as good as yeah. something like Indian Summer. Well, that makes me feel better because that's why I didn't buy it, fear of that. But I got talking to Tim about my soil and how to keep things through a wet winter because I have clay. And he had a really interesting idea of if you can't create a raised bed or raise your entire bed, then you could almost create like a raised pocket for a plant. You could build yes. up um, with bricks or, you know, a bit of board or something and, and plant something that you fear is not going to be hardy through a wet winter in your soil. Plant it just that little bit higher because you're not going to notice it when everything's grown up. And I, I'm definitely going to experiment yes. with that. That's a Victorian technique known as mound planting. And there's a garden near here called Batsford Arboretum where they have a lot of cherries, but it lays very wet there in winter and they do a lot of that. They make a mound, um, probably only about a foot, 18 inches high and then plant into that. So that's a good idea of Tim's. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to try it, particularly because when it comes around to my Flomo, um, it's going to be very relevant. Oh, I don't know what my Flomo is yet. I've got to do some thinking. <laughs> well, I've got hundreds now. We started well, this podcast in a, in I, I've got lots of Flomo as ever, really, which would make sense as the creator of the feature. Uh, and I'm not sure anyone else has, but fortunately, I probably have enough Flomo to go round. <laughs> If, if you've never caught this podcast before, if this is the first time you're listening or watching, FLOMO is a feeling you must have. It's that kind of fear of missing out you get when you see a plant that you want to grow, whether it's in real life or in a magazine or on Instagram. And the reason, well, one of the reasons I went to Plants as Preference is because he, um, Tim had posted a photo of a Nifophia or a Niphophia, as uh, we were taught uh, to say it the other week in Joe Sharma's podcast. And oh, a, really? <laughs> after Mr. <laughs> Nipoff. Nip it was a Thomsonii called, I have to look at my notes here, Kitschichio, possibly, which I, know that. I think might be a John, John Grimshaw find. And it's a mm. sort of slightly orangey in bud before it opens to a more yellow and slightly dusky at the top of the spire of flower as well. <laughs> And this is why I need my uh, my little raised mound planting because I have my suspicions that it will not be hardy in my soil. But I needed to buy a red hot poker because it was the first plant my non gardening partner could recognise and name. So we need one in our garden, and I've been on the lookout for an interesting uh, red hot poker or fire stick, as he named it when he first learned it. Um, I needed one for my <laughs> right. garden. So that's that's my first Nifophia, Nifophia, Nipophia, however we want to say it. And uh, and I'm very excited about it. Yes, I love them. I, I've got lots in the garden and they come through. I mean, generally, they do come through the, through in my soil. Um, I, the only one that can be a little bit iffy is Ruperi, which is the October flowering one for me with a triangular orange head. And I, t I sometimes put a cloche over that if we're having a very bad winter. I have lost some of that before, but I do love them. Do you have Absolutely. a favorite in your garden? Well, I, ha I think I've told you about this one before, which is um, Prince Eagle that I got from Felly Priory. Um, and it flowers in August and it's enormous. It's eight foot tall and it has about 60 flowers on it. So it takes up a lot of room. <laughs> I, I bought it from Felly Priory. Uh, when I was writing the garden up and it was in the garden and the woman took me upstairs, Mrs. Charworth Musters, I think I may have mentioned this, and she flung open the window and said, I sleep with a shotgun under the bed to shoot the rabbits. I wrote that in an article once and the family complained, but it actually happened. So I always think of her when, because she's died now, um, I always think of her when that flowers, my, my Prince Eagle. And I got into a terrible argument with people because they said it was the same as Euvaria nobilis. And I said, no, no, it isn't. Because I had both and I knew it wasn't the same. Um, the foliage is different and everything. So um, it's, it's, it's quite hard to find, I think, Prince Eagle. But that's my favourite. But I, I've got lots of them. I quite like Penny Rockets, which was um, a Brassingham one, which has lots of little slender orange tapers. And I grow it 
amongst agapanthus that are in the ground so that hopefully flower together and you get that orange and blue. It's, people are so sniffy about orange, but it's the touch sort of paper colour um, for things, all the blues and the purples, whatever colour you want, really. It's a wonderful colour mm. in the garden. So I use it quite a lot. Alan, do you have any uh, red hot pokers or fire sticks you would like to shout about? Well, I do like um, I do like the uh, uh, Nymphophias with <laughs> with very pale flowers. I have to say, yeah. I, I mean, we all started with probably the, that little dwarf one that was bred by Beth Chateau. Little maid. Little maid. Thank you. I just love the ones with the green and the um, cream flowers. And it's quite interesting because if you look at Nephophias as a group, you will find that there is some that flower right the way throughout the year if your garden's mild mm -hmm. enough. But because of the lower light levels, a flower that was born in summer, with, which will be orange, will in the middle of winter, in the depths of winter, if it produces flowers at all, they will probably be green. And so yeah. you get you get that all down to the light levels you see um and you get you get that variation but i do like um the tall and the large growing pale creamy green ones i think they appeal to me enormously mm. oh. is that Percy's pride um Percy's pride is one i definitely have and little maid i definitely have um yes. it'd be interesting to grow the two together and just sow, sow some seed and see what happens because Percy's pride you probably know this has a norfolk connection Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah. Percy Piper was um, Alan Bloom's uh, propagator of herbaceous exactly. plants. Yeah, mm. I like the yeah. way that uh, how Alan Bloom actually didn't want to put everything Bressingham, 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 and he no. chose. He cho I mean, he chose his children to name plants after, but also the people that worked with him, and I think that's yes. rather nice. Yeah, he he named a flock Eva Cullum. Yeah, the lady in the office that used to do the sort of dispatch you know, get all the notes ready and things. So that's Eva Cullum. And um, then the other one, a, Lawrence Flatman did the Alpines. Yes. And he named a geranium after that. And, you know, when Alan was very, very old, um, he was quite a lonely, he, he became lonely, definitely, like a lot of older people do. And he loved to go out in the, in the garden and see the visitors. But every week, Lawrence Flatman, Percy Piper and Alan would have coffee together, the three of them. Mm. I thought that was wonderful. Well, they chew the fat, breathe small Yes, yes. And he goes to Broad North. Before we leave Flomo then, if no one else has anything to chip in with, I did have another, which was um, from weeks ago, I saw a Dianthus in um i think it was newark park we we stopped off we always have to go to dog friendly gardens but we stopped off on the way to our holiday at newark park and uh, they've got sort of little areas they're focused on their their planting and it was dianthus carthusianorum which was yes. fantastic and yes. i just thought why don't i have this and then when i was at tim's nursery i was gazing adoringly at this nephophia and I looked across the nursery and there was just one Diane yes. flower head bobbing above all the other plants and I was like oh, there it is so yes. I felt justified in buying that because it was legitimately on my wish list and so they're both Flomos which Alan Gray style I have converted to garden plants yes. <laughs> for the weekend. But it's very very easy to grow from seed. Um, Chilton's seeds have the Dianthus carthusianorum. There's several different forms, but it is lovely. And I, I, I grow it qu quite well here. I've, they don't lo live all that long. So I find that I have several for about five years and then suddenly I've got none. So I actually bought one of those uh, <laughs> from a plant, uh, an, an Alpine Garden Society plant sale on Saturday uh, that I'm going to, but um, they are very easy from seed. And there's another smaller one that was in a Chelsea garden called Cruentus. Yes. Cruentus, which is very similar but much shorter and the flowers are still that magenta but bigger and mm. it has um turquoise uh, anthers and we had a quite a bit of it in the garden one year and it was quite surreal because all the the bees um had a uh, turquoise pollen in their <laughs> pollen sacks <laughs> it was really odd <laughs> wow that's amazing <laughs> So I, I approve of your choice. Uh, well, I that's think what I'm always seeking Valborn's approval. 
airy plants are great, willowy plants are great, because they can sort of move and sway and pop up through things. I'm not a great fan of the short stubby plants that nurseries love to sell you because they can get them on a trolley. So mm. when they breed the compact echinacea and you know the compact this and the compact that, I, I sort of groan. I'd much rather have something with movement. It's so funny you say that. I don't know if it's because I've spent so much time with Alan and he is similarly similarly drawn to those plants but the other half laughs at me because I always plant what he calls stately home plants because yes. they're big and they're tall yes and well, they're, you know, they, they're big for my garden yes well I like height and uh, I think it's because when I was a child I looked through flowers and I was three my earliest memory is watching a bee on an aquilegia and I was hooked from that day and I think now that I'm sort of reach the dizzy heights of five foot five. I'm probably going to slip down the other side now that <laughs> I've gone past three score years and 10, but I still like to look through plants. So I love things like sanguisorbas and all those tall plants, miscanthus, helianthus, lemon queen, all those tall things. I love them. Cephalaria gigantia. I just love that. I, just... I can't grow that very well. Well, I don't think I can, but I keep trying. <laughs> I did it. I did it to Hook Norton. I mean, it was wonderful to cut. But, you know, again, all the scabious are wonderful hoverfly plants. Yeah. So they're really well worth growing. But that's one thing I really have, can't grow here. It just doesn't flower. I don't know whether I've got the right, the wrong plant, because there's it's mixed up in the trade with another one, which is shorter called Tartarica. So um, I might have the wrong plant. Well, let's not get started on any kind of scabious because no, I'm not there's not enough time again. and I have many scabious to talk about. And we yes. haven't got time for it. We'll have to yeah. have another podcast, but you're sure to come back. Um, hopefully, Well, we'll you have... might not have me back. <laughs> well, if, if you'll come back, we'll have you back because it's always an absolute treat. Um, thank you so much. I'm so inspired. I'm sure you are as well, Mr. Gray. Yes, I am. And I've just got to find that buddlier. Um, yes, pink, 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 pink pagoda. It's yeah. a way Ariana. Um, and what it does it is it has nice foliage, grey foliage, and um, then it has the, a bobble of pink flowers with slightly orange uh, eyes, and then it has more of a sort of blunt spike. It's just the fact that it's late and our autumns are becoming ever more benign. That's why I want. Yes, to. I know. Yes, it's you know the seasons have changed so much. I can remember when I was teaching and I went back to school and about the seventh of September, and um, I was only there for a week and I'd be back in winter clothing. Whereas well, yeah. now you go through <laughs> November quite often. Yeah. Yeah. Gardening yeah. in a t-shirt in November is definitely a yeah. regular occurrence. Goosebumps on your legs. <laughs> I'll leave you with that image. <laughs> Well, happy butterfly spotting and happy birthday, Val. Oh, yes, I'm so excited. I've got lots of cards on the dresser that come <laughs> in the post. Have a lovely birthday, Val Iris Vanessa Bourne. Yes, I'm going to definitely go for Iris Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> and happy gardening, everybody. Yes, happy gardening. Lovely to bye see bye. everybody. Lovely. Oh, love love to you, Alan. <laughs> bye. Love you, Val. Bye-bye. Yay, there's Val. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> I've got a new rescue cat called Frank. <laughs> if you hear noises off of <laughs> his box is behind me. I'll try not to talk too much, Alan. <laughs> Shut me up. I have to have a secret signal. It's do this or something. <laughs> I've got two of my favourite <laughs> staples. Graham, I've got the right name, haven't I? Yes. 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 Not Graham Allen, I know who I mean. <laughs> I knew you. I'm a very hard month. I've written so many things. My head is stretched. <laughs>